All right. How's everyone doing today? Well, my name is Chris Garrett. So I'm going to be talking about hunting on the endpoint using some built in PowerShell uh, commands. Built a framework. I'm actually going to be open sourcing this. I did not post it yet because of uh, pride. I've got to clean up some of the code that looks messy. So, but that should be posted by tonight or tomorrow. Um, so everything you see here will be available. Um, and you can go ahead and download that, see, see what we're doing. Um, my background, uh, I was in the Air Force for 10 years. I did an incident response for the Air Force CERT for about five of that, those years. Um, I helped establish the Enterprise Hunt team there. Um, our, our entire job, we had a team that would go out and look for compromises on our network. Um, after that, ended up founding a company called InfoSight uh, to build a product and a tool set to do hunting on the endpoint. Um, so you can follow me here. But one of the key things here is PowerShell was really great. And I, I started using PowerShell uh, very early. Um, I was an electrical engineer in school, but I never actually did professional coding. I never did professional programming. Um, when it came to getting stuff done, PowerShell was really the way I went with it because it enables so much power, uh, especially on Windows systems, which you know, government, all, all they have is Windows. Um, it enables so much power to do automation, to uh, deal with data sets, to deal with Excel spreadsheets, things like that. So that's kind of where I got started with PowerShell was just being able to um, parse things, parse uh, uh, spreadsheets was how I started. Um, that led into hunting where I had to get additional information from the, the, computer, uh, from the host and the tools I had wasn't giving me the information. So PowerShell unlocked that and some recent advances in PowerShell, uh, which I'll show you, have unlocked even more to make it easier to get anything you want off of a system. So I'll talk about threat hunting. Um, what is it? There's a lot of marketing out there today. And two years ago when I got out of the military and created InfoSight, we uh, got told no one's ever heard of that thing unless you've been in the military. Now everyone's heard of it and everyone has marketing on it. So that's fun. Um, so what is it? It's a proactive search for threats hiding within a network you control. That's really what, what it's all about. It's not, um, it's not a firewall. It's not, a, um, it's not using antivirus because what most tools on your network are trying to do is prevent an attack from getting in. You want to stop CryptoLocker from getting in. You want to stop an attack from getting in. That's the number one priority. Unfortunately, that's never 100%, especially when you have insider threats, when you have people getting in your network around your automation. How do you find that stuff? Can you go back on your logs? Was it logged? If it's been there for six months, do your logs go back far enough? You know, all these things are, are big problems when it comes to persistent compromises. And that's really the, the big problem is persistent compromises. Most of the tools today are to stop exploitation, to stop installation of malware, um, your on-access scans and things that, that look at malware either in transit or as it's executing. Very little, very few tools, and I've evaluated a lot, very few of them actually look in memory, look in an operating system to find out if you already have a rootkit installed. There's some open source tools out there, but for the most part, our products don't do that, even in the enterprise. Um, so the big problem is many are breached and don't know it. You see the headlines every day. Um, they're, going, they're being breached for a very long time. Just the, the DNC hacks, you know, that was a year. The OPM hack, that was a year. Everybody that, every breach report that comes out, it's usually been there for a year and they didn't know it. And I've got a long list of these things and how long it took for them to actually find it. How are they finding them today? Usually it's, it's Brian Krebs writing an article or uh, the FBI telling you nine months later that they saw some stuff go to Ukraine. Um, but that's legitimately, almost all of them are found that way. So hunting really bridges that gap. Let's go find some, some breaches. Um, this debate comes up a lot. Is Hunt and digital forensics, is that the same thing? Eh, sort of. They use a lot of the same techniques, but it is different because we're going to be more scalable. Um, a lot of the, the products that are in use today for forensics and incident response are not very scalable when it comes to looking for a, a, a wide net. If you know what you're looking for and you have a breadcrumb trail, perfect. If you're analyzing one host, there's a lot of tools to do that. But what if you have 1,000 or 10,000? How am I going to do that? You need to be um, very scalable, and you need to reduce the complexity. Otherwise, you're just not going to be able to do this very often. Um, there's another thing when it comes to hunting is principle of diminishing returns. A lot of people, when they get started with hunting, is they're looking for something specific. Like, let's go look for you know, signs of mimicats being run. Um, and they go look for that. But if you're just looking for one thing, you're going to have a problem when it comes to, hey, is that thing even there? Did they use that tool? Or did they use a different tool? 
So if you're just looking for something, and I call that focused or IOC-based hunts, you're looking for something that you know you want to look for. It's some kind of hypothesis. You know, I'm looking for this specific type of malware. I don't recommend that because it's just not scalable and there's no ROI in it. Um, so the methodology we're going to sh uh, show you today is basically collect a lot of stuff from the endpoint, compare it against you know, every data source we have to see if we can find things, and then filter to the top through, uh, through anomaly detection what's interesting to look at. I guarantee if you have some reverse engineering skills or if you have some malware analysis skills, if you're looking at malware, it's going to be pretty obvious to you. The problem is you have 10,000 hosts and there's a, hundreds of thousands of processes and, and drivers and everything running in your environment. How do you filter that down to something manageable? So in the Hunter's tool bag, there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, there's endpoint solutions, there's data-centric solutions. If you're in a large enterprise, you're going to do a data-centric, usually. Almost all of the information online right now about hunting is data-centric. You've got some kind of database, a Hadoop cluster or something that has a massive load of logs and event data and packets. How am I going to hunt in there? How am I going to um, build queries that let me find additional context in there and find, find those, uh, those bad guys rolling around in my network? Um, you're not going to have that access to that data, and that data is not going to go back far enough if, you're not, if you don't have a limited budget, which most people don't. So uh, the solution we're going to show you is an endpoint solution, scripting. We're going to be able to find everything on a host, regardless of what security stack is already there and what you've collected. And then, of course, malware analysis tools. When you do find something suspicious and weird, um, actually verifying that that's actually malware. You need to be able to do that as well. So again, that's just two different ways. Big enterprise, event data-centric. Um, the rest of us, we're going to do an endpoint validation strategy. Validate what's on these systems. If I don't trust this computer, how do I begin to trust it? So without further ado, I introduced Power, uh, PS Hunt is the uh, threat hunting module that we're going to be releasing today. It is a PowerShell module that allows you to um, scan systems, it gives you a couple different options to either look for information that you want to look for or just survey systems for everything um, from what's running, what's triggered to run to any manipulation that we're looking for. So we'll go through that. The different components of this, um, there's about six different components. I break it down into scanners and surveys. So a scanner is a script or a, a utility where I'm going to be looking for something remotely. I'm going to be using WMI. I'm going to be using remote uh, registry to say, I want to find this one registry key across my entire environment. That's going to be very fast, and it's going to be threaded. So I can look for that one item. If I know I've got a problem, and this specific malware uses a named pipe, you can enumerate named pipes. And that's for, uh, for clarification. That is when any malware that does lateral movement with uh, um, SMB, which is very modern. Everybody's doing it these days. Um, if they use a specific name pipe, you can enumerate that name pipe remotely using WMI. So that's a scanner. A survey is a script or a module or an executable that I'm going to drop on that box and execute and let it run. That's where we're going to get more information. WMI and everything else and, and remote registry is not going to give you the kind of information we need at the level we need. Uh, so a survey is something that gets dropped on that box. And we have uh, one major one that, uh, that I developed that lets you get all the information you need from that host. Discovery, what assets are out there, building a target list, um, your utilities for transport and execution, um, and then how do you analyze the data from that survey, and then how do you analyze files that you identify. So all of these components go into the, the, the PS Hunt framework. Uh, scanners, again, this is going to be used to rapidly scan systems. Basically, I'm doing WMI queries, I'm doing registry queries. Those are the main ones. Looking for that one thing. Surveys are, again, dropped on the host. Some of the challenges is, a, how do I get it on a lot of hosts? We've got the tr uh, transport and execution methods for that. Um, B is how do I get it back? How do I get that information that I just dropped on disk or wants to return to me from memory? So if this is going to run for a little while, because mo most of my surveys do, a couple minutes, uh, one way to be scalable is you can either go back and pick it up from your main box that you just deployed it from, or you can have it automatically send it up to a, a, an HTTP server or an FTP server. So that's how you do it scalably. I usually host one on the box that I'm scanning from so that it always returns to a folder that I, I have. There's another way to do this. Uh, so the surveys themselves can be quite large if you're packaging um, other executables. So our, the implementation here is going to use some sys internals tools. So I actually use SigCheck, for instance, because doing signature checking in PowerShell is hard. Um, 
So I use that. That's an extra 500 kilobytes. So there's two ways to do that. If you have an executable, if you want to get down to kernel level, you're going to need an executable. PowerShell won't let you get down to kernel. Um, you can do it two ways. One, I use a function called a download file. That basically says, I have my script. It's very small. When I deploy it out, that host is going to download from the internet an additional module. So I actually download uh, SigCheck from Microsoft uh, System Kernels Live. So they host it. It downloads to the box and gets executed if it's not already on the box. Another way is if you don't have access to the internet and you don't want to you know, make 10,000 boxes call out to Microsoft Live, um, you can actually convert that binary into a, a base64 string, put that in your script, and now your script has that executable to be dropped on disk when it runs. Um, that's some really cool ways to do it. it. Packages everything up into one PowerShell script. So how are we going to get it there? Um, I implemented five different ways to do uh, transport and execution. Uh, transport's usually done with SMB, server message block, basically just copy file, um, for those PowerShell folks that know that. Uh, WMI, PowerShell remoting, scheduled tasks, and service manager, all of those are implemented into one wrapper, which uh, I'll show in a second. So all of them are wrapped into one PowerShell script. If I want to deploy a survey, it's going to basically reach out, figure out which ones are available on that host, if it's a Linux host, it'll tell you to go away. Um, if, it's, if it's got WMI exposed, then it's going to use WMI. Um, if that doesn't work, it'll, it'll back down to scheduled tasks. So all those use a different port. Um, I would do this all with PowerShell remoting, but I've almost never seen a network that has it enabled. They're very rare. So I am a big advocate that you enable it. PowerShell remoting should be your primary um, remote admin protocol. It is awesome. It lets you do anything you, you need to do on a network and managing it. doing discovery and access, we have to get access to the system on these ports. So depending on what protocol we're using, uh, we, need, we need these port access. So there's a couple discovery tools in there that allow you to automatically do this. If you go ahead and just hit the, um, the uh, invokes remote task, which is the, the task that does it, it will automatically do all this for you. You don't have to remember it. Um, but it'll look for TCP ports. It'll look for assets out, at there, out in your network to be able to find it and determine if it's the right operating system, things like that. The Windows host survey is pretty complicated, a lot of code in it, but each of the functions is fairly well uh, defined and doesn't have a lot of dependencies. So if you want to go online, use it, you need a function that you know, enumerates all the named pipes, I got a function in there for that. So you can just take that out of there. Um, so what we're going to do is get active processes, modules, drivers, any floating or injected DLLs in memory. Um, we're going to look for active connections, any auto starts. The implementation I have for auto starts is just auto runs, so it'll download system journals auto runs. It's not perfect, but it does the job. Um, and accounts and key event logs for execution. So the idea for the survey is to collect enough comprehensive information to give me what's the state of this system. Just to, uh, normally in PowerShell, you can do a command like git process. And git process will give you the process list. Unfortunately, it doesn't have all the information we need for hunting. It doesn't have the hash. It doesn't have signature information. Um, it doesn't have the owner of that process. So there's a bunch of things that are missing from the standard utilities that are in PowerShell. So I built a wrapper for that to put all that information in there. So the survey is collecting with my get process list. It'll get the process list from WMI. It'll get it from uh, additional information, such as the loaded modules. It'll get the hashes. It'll do signature checking and validation, uh, as well as get the owner. So, Everything from processes, modules, drivers, auto runs, everything's going to have a similar um, layout to it to where all that information is available for me. And when you actually see malware, there's going to be a lot of things missing and there's going to be a lot of things weird. And so I'll show you that uh, a little bit later here. Persistence mechanisms. Right now, uh, system internals auto runs is going to be what we're using. We'll download that, execute it and then wrap some additional information in there as well. So just as an example, um, here's my totally not malware free online games.exe. Uh, this is you know, running, and it's going to run key. So you're going to be able to enumerate all those with auto runs. Uh, this is the other thing. When you get this, uh, this kind of information on every file, you're going to find things missing. Most people who write software for a living for like companies to use forget to put a publisher name sometimes. They forget. You know, to put a version name in there. Um, but 
malware writers almost never bother. So you, a lot of times you don't see any of that in there unless they trojanize another executable. Uh, another thing that I always find, if it's not a trojanized, is the internal name is never the same as the actual file name. Because when they're deploying malware, they'll try to hide it as a different file name, hide it in with the system. So that internal name is almost never the same. So those are the types of things you can do with that data set, is just look for that, that kind of um, pattern. So memory resonant malware, this is the cool part. So Matt Graber, if you've ever used PowerSploit or any of those other tools, uh, he built a module called PS Reflect, and it changed my life with PowerShell because I no longer have to compile C code, I no longer have to do, um, you know, I, no, I no longer have to use .NET to get access to the native Windows API. So just directly from PowerShell, just by including his PS Reflect module into our survey, um, anywhere else I'm using, I have direct access to native Win32 APIs. I can troll through memory, I can look for things. Um, so the implementation I have for this, to look for this, is I'm gonna do a, a virtual query walk across process memory, and I'm just looking for portable executables in unprotected memory spaces. Uh, that's uh, a pretty effective way to do it. There are ways around it, but that pretty much finds 98% of the malware out there that uses process injection, and almost all malware does. In fact, I don't have any, this is all user mode, so um, a question that might come up is what about kernel mode rootkits, how do you find those? Well, modern rootkit design uh, actually doesn't have all the functionality in the kernel module. So every rootkit that I've seen, from like Euroboros to everything, they don't put all their functionality in it. If they got networking functionality or parsing or command interpretation, all of that is in a user mode DLL that the kernel module injects into memory. So you can find most kernel mode rootkits by just looking for their uh, injected modules in memory using this. So how do you analyze this data once you get it? So we got a few functions. Um, I have a list of reputation. So if I've done a virus total lookup, I store that data. If I've got, um, I've downloaded the NIST database, I have a list of hashes from the NIST database just to give me my whitelist and my blacklist. Um, I load that right now into a global variable. So it's all in memory to do lookups against. Uh, this might be better to do with like, a, like an SQL Lite or something, SQLite. Uh, but for now, I just do it with pure PowerShell and load it to memory. So make sure you have you know, a gig of extra memory because I'm storing a lot of lists in there. Um, so the objective is to compare everything we find in these surveys against the whitelist and the blacklist. Query virus total. Um, we can put additional modules in there to query you know, another set of threat intel sources. But for now, we just got virus total in there. Um, and we'll, the implementation I have available if you only have a free API key from VirusTotal, you can only do one lookup uh, every 15 seconds. That's their throttling. So usually when I'm doing it with a free key, uh, I'll just run this overnight. So you can do about, at that rate, you can do about 5,000 hashes lookups a day with VirusTotal with a free key. Um, and then if you've got 1,000 hosts, you need to group them so that you can look at all the data at once. You don't want to look at one host at a time I got another function called group host object. So the host object is what I call the results of that survey. Um, we'll group that together so we can look at all the data once, just with the unique set. If you've, got 10, if you've got 1,000 Windows 7 boxes, you'll have the same Internet Explorer on most of them. So uniquing that set and, and grouping it uh, makes a lot of sense for that. So let's put it all together. How are we going to do this? So when we actually deploy, we're going to be sending out our surveys to the host. It's going to get what's running, what's triggered to run and any indicators compromised that I'm looking for. We'll collect that either through uh, going to grab it or waiting for it to return to my FTP server. Then I'm gonna do some lookups. I'm doing that on the back end. The system internals tools actually do lookups themselves. I have that disabled because I don't want every box doing that. Uh, so I aggregate all the data, unique it, and then I'll do my virus total lookups and my hash reputation lookups. After that, you get a certain number of suspicious executables, unknowns, no one's ever seen this before. You're gonna get a set of those. Those are the what you actually triage. You look for uh, anomalies and unknowns. You do some data stacking to be able to find out, hey, this is an interesting guy. Let's pull a sample of that file back from one of those hosts, and let's submit that to VirusTotal. Let's submit that into, um, let's pop it into PE Studio, so um, some of these open source tools that allow you to do that. Uh, PowerShell Arsenal has some cool RE tools that you can use. Um, and then, of course, dynamic analysis if you want to pop it in a sandbox. So malware.com's free. You can do Cuckoo. That's free. 
That's not part of the um, PS Hunt module yet. That's kind of uh, manual right now, but it will be implemented later. So how do we find bad things? Um, misspellings and lack of spaces. All right, active processes, modules, drivers. All these things are gonna be normalized in the same data set. So we can stack them, we can look at them. So a lot of malware today, if it's advanced, it's not gonna to try to hide from you. So there are things that'll hide, rootkits that'll hide, user mode rootkits, rootkits that'll hide. Um, a lot of malware today hides in plain sight. So you, know, you can still enumerate it using these, these, uh, these API calls. Um, the initial technique, of course, is to hash everything, compare it, um, look for digital signatures, make sure it's the correct digital signature and a good CA, uh, a certificate authority, um, and then compare that against virus total. And that'll clear all our good knowns, uh, known goods, known bads. From the unknowns, stack the remaining data and do anomaly and outlier analysis. Look for things that are weird, look for things that are out of place, look for uh, do frequency analysis and say, I've got a thousand boxes that have that version of explorer.exe, but you've got you know, this other one running on this one box, and that's interesting because it doesn't look like a Microsoft file. So anomaly analysis and outlier analysis using that data set. And PowerShell is awesome for that because you can filter things, you can structure it in different ways, it's awesome. Uh, and then of course, when, that, when you've filtered that list down to something manageable, start analyzing those files and do it with static and dynamic analysis. Digital signatures, most malware is not digitally signed, especially when they're popping different DLLs around. Um, and the ones that are, oftentimes they load a rogue certificate authority into your Windows host. So uh, one of the things that the survey does is collect all of the certificate authorities that are loaded in the trusted host store on every computer, um, and then we'll be able to check that. They all have serial numbers, they're all searchable online, and you can tell you know, whose certificate authority is this. Um, I used to think that there was a good set of certificate authorities, there isn't. There's no online like, whitelist of certificate authorities that's good other than Microsoft set. Um, and most of the experience I have is a lot of people stand up their own certificate authorities, especially in an enterprise. They actually have their own, and they're not even like, it fails every check you do because they've implemented it wrong. Um, so just be aware of that. But oftentimes you can find um, rogue CAs that someone's just stood up, signed their malware. So if you're not doing your signature cor uh, checking correctly, it'll come up as signed on that host. And of course, if someone compromises a legitimate CA, you're screwed with this technique, so it's not gonna work. And that's what happened with like Bit9 CA in 2013. Persistence mechanisms, um, trolling through scheduled tasks, jobs, uh, um, registry persistence, uh, looking for anything referencing an executable or a script. So once we have that reference, we're gonna collect the same data that we would normally collect on our processes. So all those things I told you about on the um, get process list, I'm doing that with anything referenced in the registry as well, especially if it's, it's referenced and it's on disk. Boot process redirection, I don't have this done yet. This is, a, it's messy, so I don't have it in there yet. But um, one way you can do that, there's a module called um, Power Forensics that you should download. It has the ability to get a lot of low level things. One of those is you can grab the MBR and if it's redirecting to a different bootloader, you can find um, boot kits as well. Memory injection, the way that it's always done, every type of memory injection out there, whether it's DLL, reflective DLL injection, or process hollowing, they all have one thing in common, and that's unprotected memory regions that are contingent. They're always in one stack. Um, you can't do reflective DLL injection in heap. You can't do it in and, and different things like that, so it's almost always going to be in one contingent memory section. There, there is some malware that will like move itself around, um, like it'll pack itself and unpack itself in memory. That's a little more advanced. This will you'll miss it with this technique, but for the most part, um, you know, 90 plus percent of malware out there will have all of their malware in contingent sections. So just look for unprotected memory regions, um, legitimately loaded DLLs. Their PE header is supposed to be read only, especially if you have um, DEP enabled. So when you look for read execute or read write execute and you find PE headers in memory, those are almost always not supposed to be there or you've got like .NET doing just in time compile in memory. So those are your false positives. You'll see that some of those, um, but oftentimes they won't have PE headers. So we'll just walk PE headers and, uh, and volatility. They do this at the kernel level. We're doing it at user mode. So uh, it's still very, very effective. Most of the malware that I've tried this on, it still finds the PE headers. 
um, unless they've mangled their PE headers, and it's just more complicated, but it does happen. So that's it for now. More to come. Some of the things that I'm working on, um, enumerating hooks, doing custom Yara scans, uh, being able to deploy that widely. Um, did a lot of cleanup of this code. This code set was actually what I showed our investors when I started my company, because we were doing this as a service for folks, going out and doing these scans. Um, so we're open sourcing this now. It's, it's an old, uh, old tool set, an old uh, code base, about two years old, but I've updated it, and I will continue to uh, maintain it. Um, but we'll be adding more uh, techniques in there to find things on the endpoint. So I'm at 30 minutes now, so I guess we have 15 minutes for questions, right? Any questions? If you're not using PowerShell, you should. And if you manage a network, please enable PS Remoting. It's a simple command. Are you posting your slides anywhere? Um, yeah. I gotta figure out where I'm gonna put that. I'll, I'll probably put it on SlideShare. So. Cool. How many people use PowerShell? Awesome. Cool. Well, I'll be, uh, I'll be around. Yeah. Oh. So, so I use this to do Active Directory assessments, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't scripted it. So have you thought about doing this with Privilege so you can kind of scan out through the network and see what kind of AV is doing and how it's being managed on, local, on an environment? Yeah, unfortunately, right now for my open source development, I don't have a big domain to test against. So I've got like a little virtual box containers with 20 boxes, so I don't get to do a whole lot of that. Um, but that is something that I would do if I had a playground. But um, yeah, all this stuff is done with privilege. Privilege, you have to have an account that has privileges. Um, and the Active Directory stuff, uh, there's, there's a couple tool sets out there that some of the pen testers have, like PowerView and a couple other tools that enumerate Active Directory, like accounts. Um, using that for hunting isn't as straightforward as I originally thought, but it can be done. 